Hello everyone. This is my first video for YouTube and I'd like to start it off by doing a video about the French defense. And um, this is an opening. I'm going to do several videos on it because there's lots of different things that we can go over but the first video I'm going to do is the advanced variation. And the French defense is one of those openings that either you love it or hate it. Um, it's, you know, a lot of people think it's passive because of this E6 move, but it's not, it's not at all passive. It's a fighting opening. And it, it's one of those openings where memorizing theory is not, is not a critical part of uh, what you're going to be doing. Unlike with the Sicilian, where the players need to memorize lots of lines because they're so critical. In the French, you can play off ideas. And so this is the critical position in the French defense, the d4 and d5. If white's playing for any kind of advantage, he needs to play d4. And today we're going to cover e5. And um, this is one, of, from a practical point of view, you'll probably see this this choice more common than any other choice one of the most common because it's it's simple you know that white doesn't have to do a whole lot here and at first it seems a little scary seeing this e5 pawn just cramp down but i think personally this is one of white's worst choices I think black has an excellent game here and I think black's almost equal already because although these pawns look very uh, intimidating they can be exploited very easily with the key move in the French defense which is c5 which I'm recommending you have to play this move or, or you're going to probably lose very quickly um, you know c5 immediately we're putting the question to the most critical square in the French defense, which is the d4 square. And the reason the d4 square is so critical is because if we gain control of that square, e5 is going to be very weak as well. And, um, you know, it's hard to, s White has to try with all his might to hold down the d4 square and, and Hence the reason he's al you're almost always going to see the move c3. And um, if white plays, th um, say, 3 knight f3, this is, this is not a good move. We're going to take on d4. White, white wants to keep a pawn on d4. If, if he has to take back on d4 with a piece, e5 is going to immediately become problematic because it's, it's not clear how he's going to hold it. So the, the move black plays here is knight c6 and as you can see we're not wasting any time and we're not fiddling around we're gonna we're hitting d4 a second time and white has only one move that even makes any kind of sense which is knight f3 the only other even possibility maybe is to play something like bishop b5 and that's not something to worry about you can play bishop d7 and if takes you can take with the b pawn and then take on d4 and then play c5 a second time so that wouldn't be any problem whatsoever so knight f3 you're going to see 99 percent of the time and this is the key this is the position you're going to almost always reach and here there's a crossroads the main move here is probably queen b6 and again this is the theme we're always pressuring the d4 point but i'm recommending a different move here which is bishop d7 and at first this move looks a little ridiculous. You know, why are we developing the queenside bishop there? Especially when we have no kingside development. But this is a tricky move. And even, even you know, players with a lot of experience screw up at this point. I've played lots of games in this position. It's a, it is theoretically a, a, a theoretically viable move. It's very good. And what this move prevents, and if you're opponent or you are rated below say maybe 1500 you're going to see the very natural looking bishop b5 and this is why bishop d7 is you know 
a very useful move. Bishop b5 is no longer possible because now white pretty much is just going to lose. We're going to take on e5 with the knight. Now we're a clear pawn ahead. If the knight takes, we're going to take the bishop and be up a pawn. Likewise, if the bishop takes, pardon me, we're going to take back with the knight. And we will be up a clear pawn for absolutely no compensation. And more importantly, we're up the most important pawn, which is the e5 pawn. I mean, that was, that was where all our problems were coming from. Not only that, we've gotten rid of, rid of our one bad piece, which was the light squared bishop. So black is absolutely winning. There's no reason why white would even draw this position. So bishop b5 is absolutely impossible now. Of course, queen a4 is as well. Um, now, the other move this more or less prevents is bishop d3. And bishop d3 looks much more logical. The bishop looks beautiful there. It's covering the whole board. But this is another reason bishop d7 is a good move. We take on d4. White has to take back with the pawn. And now we play queen b6. And white has a problem. Because we are threatening to take on d4. Because since the bishop is on d7, there are no discoveries on the queen. So for just as an example. And this is, white plays this way. This is actually a real way to play for white. It's not queen takes. And now bishop d7 covers this check. The only reason white might would play this is if he's looking to give up a pawn intentionally. He's going to play a move like rook e1. He's going to play knight c3 and bishop e3 maybe um, for quick development. Now in this case, being up the pawn is not at all winning. This is more like compensation for white's very, very quick development. So I would say um, this is an equal. White has it's hard to call this one. White probably has plenty. It, white has a compensation for a pawn. I don't know if he has more. I definitely am not afraid to play this as black. You just have to be cautious. And if you trade off all the pieces, you're just going to win. You're a pawn up. So, um, but a lot of times the players don't know what they're doing. And they aren't aware even. And a lot of players do not want to give up a pawn even if they think there's compensation. So they'll play bishop c2. I've seen this played many times. And now black is better. There's no doubt about it. We play knight b4. Not only do we have the initiative, but we're attacking white's most valuable piece, the light square bishop. And there's really not a lot he can do here. Um, I mean, if he try, he's got to give up the bishop. I mean, if he preserves the bishop with a move like bishop b3, we could even play bishop b5. Uh, uh, bishop b f yeah. And it's not clear how white's going to castle in the near future at least not easily um, y and this move is not at all the only one possible I mean if knight c3 we can go back to a6 bishop a6 and this is definitely not a problem and there's plenty of other moves rook c8 um, even even a5 could be played here so there's a lot of options for black and look at the white bishop I mean what is it doing on b3 yeah you preserved it but you put it on the most useless diagonal known to man so I don't know if if even that bishop is is worth very much so you know and if white just castles here we're going to take on we're going to take on c2 queen takes and play rook c8 and, and develop the bishop dark square bishop very quickly we're going to play knight e7 and knight f5 and have a very easy game so more or less bishop d3 is going to be out of the question and the main main move now is bishop e2 and here I'm going, you know, I'm going to cover about maybe f five more minutes because of the time constraints YouTube puts on these videos, and I'm definitely going to do a part two and maybe even a part three. But the move that that the absolute best move here is ninety seven, and of course, you know, White is of course not going to want to take here. We're just going to go knight g six. We're double attacking these pawns, and. The, no matter what white plays next, the e5 pawn is going to fall. And after that, white, black has much more central control. We have two central pawns and white has none. And furthermore, white didn't even win a pawn for this. I mean, he might think he was winning a pawn, but after knight g6, he's just 
going to have a horrible positional disadvantage, really, after playing something like b4. So white absolutely should not take here, and he should castle. And this is the key idea. Knight g6 is playable here, but I think better is knight f5, and I, I most most French players would agree with me, I'm sure, because this is in keeping with our strategy of playing for the d4 square. Because when d4 goes, e5 is going to go very quickly. And here is where we meet a crossroads for white. There's several possibilities. Rook e1, knight a2. I'm going to cover some of them in you know, maybe a different video. Let's just go with knight a3 for now. This is a very common move. And the idea, it looks wacky, but it's just next move white's going to play knight c2. And um, he's going to try to hold down d4 that way. So we can take, take, and play bishop e7. And, um, you know, let's just say white continues with this plan, knight c2. We're going to castle, and after a move like rook e1, our, our plan here is, is f6. This is our goal. In all positions, almost every variation of the French, we're going to aim for this type of a move. And, uh, you know, white has problems figuring out what he's going to do with this. It's not easy at all for him to deal with this situation. It, I mean, taking here, and eventually he's either going to have to, or we're going to take. But we're going to take with the bishop. And yet again, we see more pressure is being added to d4. And eventually we're going to, I mean, maybe even next move, we'll play queen b6. And white's going to have to hold down the d4 square, which is going to be weak the entire game. Um, and you know this is the central strategy of the French we allow white to get a huge center we play c5 we take on d4 and then we play f6 and we're going to undermine the center both from the base and from the front um, and you know here let's say instead of rookie one a very aggressive player this is played pretty frequently we might play g4 here and uh, you know you can go to either spot with the knight you can go to h6 it is a playable move but I would just recommend going to h you know h4 and um, it's to me you know white has to take this knight if he doesn't take it if he plays some other move like rookie one we are gonna take and now the bishops gonna take and now you know, what on earth is that bishop doing there? Is he attacking the d5 pawn? I mean, that's not a problem. The, the bishop is poorly placed on that diagonal. It's There's nothing for it there. And now he's going to have to waste a tempo to bring the bishop back. So we would essentially be up a tempo there. So white is going to want to take. And here, you know, we take back with the bishop, and our strategy is not going to change. We're going to continue to pressure d4, we're going to play f6, and, uh, you know, white can't get too frisky here with moves like f4, because they can be very dangerous. Uh, you know, we've always got queen b6 in the works, and we're hitting b2, we're hitting d4, we've got f6, and we can take. It's... You know, white can try this caveman strategy, but it's definitely a, a little more risky than, than anything. So, I just want to, this is all I'm going to be able to do today on this variation. I just wanted to go over the key points here. E5, which we're, is what we're covering, the advanced variation. And C5, which is the key move. C3, knight C6, knight F3. And this move, bishop D7 bishop e2 and knight e7 and knight f5 and this is the structure we're going for all the time and uh, you know we don't need to memorize all these variations we know what structure we're aiming for we know where we want our pieces and so if our opponent surprises us you know it's not a big deal we know what we're aiming for we're, we're always going for the same thing and, and, and in the next video I'll try to show maybe an illustrative game of that thank you for your time bye